I think people not in the art world, if you tell them this is a sculpture, they think they ask like, do you carve in stone or clay? And it's like, no, I, I made a, a hut and I'm playing sound inside it. That's, you know, and so I think um, sculpture does have kind of a throwback feel to it, just a word. Um, but yeah, as far as, yeah, I think it's very squishy. I think oftentimes the reason I end up, you know, making sculpture or working in a sculptural way is it's the et cetera category to me. It's everything gets to pile in there together. So, um, you know, most of my work really sits at the intersection of, of some object and thinking about language and words and performance. And so it kind of exists along this performative, sculptural, written, you know, um, scale. So um, for me, sculpture allows me to fill spaces. It allows me to have an impact on somebody who's standing in the space. Um, I often think of my work being like viewer centric work, so it can be interactive, it can be about reading and listening, and so sculpture allows me to kind of um, in some way be there in a physical way, even if my body isn't there with the viewer that's, that's looking at it. Um, and then, like I said, kind of sculpture also uh, gets to be the, the catch all. I come from like a pure video background, and that um, you know, turned into sculptures, just wanting to be in an art setting or like in a gallery setting rather than in like a screening setting. Um, because I never felt like I wanted my work to be received by people like, like locked into a chair sitting and watching something happening, but like be able to engage with it. Um, you know, in their own, at their own pace. I like to use new media, technology, where you can do that in sculpture and not in other disciplines. So by being able to use this, I am able to have people interact with the piece on a greater level, in my opinion. And interacting with my work is very important to me. Uh, people are attracted to screens also, so they see them, they move, they change, they light up. So you already have the viewer in that sense. It's not even about like sculpture's constraints, but like what um, sculpture can add to a video or like a digital thing and how it can like bring it into, you know, our physical world. I actually like that a lot. That is actually something that I, I think about in my work. Um, because I, I sort of view attention as, as currency. Um, and you have a certain amount of, of attention currency that something demands or it's something that you can give. Um, so attention. See, I already, I already stopped paying attention. I lost, lost my train of thought. It is something that happens over time when a new kind of technology is being grappled with. I think there's uh, a new generation of people who have cell phones for the first time and who grow up in the digital age and are trying to understand what that means for our attention spans and where we relate to each other. You know, I've been thinking about this concept for a long time. Um, I've been one of those like naysayers of of digital digital just technology actually technology, um, and it's so fun to work with Darcy um, because she seems kind of like a proponent and an explorer of this this kind of technology and digital media. Um, so to me, you know, I've had this like negative reaction to all this this kind of influx and infusion of digital just junk in my life um, and I feel very distracted by it like honestly like plainly speaking I feel really distracted by it so I started thinking more and more about it and I honestly had kind of a, a crazy year and I was thinking about what are the ways that I've been distracting myself when thinking about different things that I've been kind of grappling with this year and I use so much um, 
technology and, and digital stuff to kind of distract myself in the world. And so I really wanted to invite artists to come into this, this show and think about the different ways that they distract themselves um, and, and explore that through digital media. Digital medium is also perfect to use when talking about distraction and giving something your attention. We give our attention so much to technology. We uh, perhaps hear our phone chime when we get a text message. And sure, we think, oh, if we don't look at it, it's not doing anything to our attention. But there's like these chemical changes going on in your mind of this chime, like, ooh, I'm important, I'm special, anything like that. So it really does change um, how we are, how we interact, uh, how we behave, how we think. And um, the immediacy of technology, I think, is a big problem with being patient now in real life. The way that we engage with the world is constantly being like beeped at and like, you know, chimed and go for a second without that. Um, and then a little dopamine, like, jolt that you get when you get, like, a new text message or something like that. Um, I don't know. I think it's, like, I try not to, like, pass judgment on it, you know, but it seems bad. Like, it seems like a bad thing to be constantly distracted and, um, you know, disengaged with the present and always, like, you know, looking away, looking for something else. I noticed my, like, annoyance and preoccupation with um, with digital technology when I was walking into an art gallery, and instead of walking in, like, open and ready to, like, engage with the artwork, I walked in with my phone, just, like, up, ready to, like, capture, and I just got so annoyed that I was experiencing the show through my phone, which was new to me. Like, it was, it was, like, Something I started doing like six months ago, not like forever. It was like six months ago. I went from being a human that like physically experienced an art show to being this jackass that was like this, this, I hate that person, you know, but I'm that person. I spend so much time sitting at my computer. In fact, I have to, you know, sometimes my distraction now is to get away from my computer. Going for a walk, being out in the world and becomes my, my new distraction because so much of my life is, is grounded here in this in this place, in this object that, that goes with me places. I don't even get rid of it when I leave the house. So, um, but I think that that means that, that the computer is our place of work and, and play as well. And now it's like this multitasking, always like being everywhere at once, sort of, um, you know, distracted, like state of being. But it's also weird because it's like you, you start catering your 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 worldview and how you communicate to this sort of short attention or long attention or whether you want a lot of people to pay attention to it quickly and shortly or whether you want a few people to pay attention to it for a long time speaking of attention span i always made the videos really short because i know that when people click around on a website even like a minute is long and it's unfortunate that our attention spans are like that you know because sometimes there's details you want somebody to know uh, and you have to cut it way down. So it became a bit of a problem how to make a really short video, like without playing into the movie trailer thing, like keep them excited and leave with a bang. Which for me is like most people will look at my work for like 30 seconds. So that's like all I got, you know, so it's like a pitch. But then if you have like these layers that like reveal themselves, you know, there's like a payoff by watching it for longer, but hopefully you can, uh, you know, just communicate something very quickly, you know, for the patience of a internet person, which is like this, you know, on Tumblr, just like, I don't know, how do you compete with that? In terms of how we deal with the internet, how we deal with um, media, uh, television, um, even printed matter very much geared towards immediate grasping of your attention. It's like billboards are, are everywhere now. So you've got seconds basically to get somebody's attention 
and not only get their attention, but get your message across, whatever that information and communication idea is, is, is about. So I do think it's kind of interesting how we, how we sort of give and take attention or we demand attention or we pass attention off or we, how we give ourselves over to it sort of wholeheartedly. So I think exploring that through art is absolutely a relevant and necessary thing. I think it's archival for sure. Um, I think it will always kind of provide a context to what's going on presently. Um, for people, if they look back on this work, um, conceptually they'll be able to see kind of what what are people looking at what are people excited about in terms of um different concepts and tensions and notions of distraction uh so i think it's archival yes and i think archival just kind of means um uh i think it's you know worthy of kind of hanging on to because i think it again it provides a context for what's happen happening presently um in terms of art making and kind of social thought and and cultural dialogue i think it'll be culturally relevant through time uh, in a way that historical movements are relevant through time, I don't think it'll stay current through time because the technology that we're dealing with now is going to be so different than the technology that we're dealing with in 10 years. And what seems so novel um, is going to lose that. So I think it'll, it'll be more like a, uh, a marker of a time period that we're in. I think the ability um, for it to be archival is different. It's such a strange thing to realize that, oh, we're using this new media. It's so new and special. And then to think, this might not exist in the future. Uh, it's very strange because then you think about painting, which to me is very traditional and perhaps old, yet it always remains that. It's always a painting. It doesn't get old, necessarily. It is very archival, and this technology, perhaps the format won't exist in the future, so it's actually not so archival. I think that paradox is very interesting uh, to think about when talking about new media. Even trying to say digital isn't as archival as a painting is, is kind of ridiculous too, because a painting, I think, um, what is it? Museum archival is like, uh, 80 years or something like that. So it's not even a century. It's, it's like not even a person's lifetime is considered archival. So it's really hard to say like what that means and whether or not that information will be accessible, uh, in the future or not. Maybe there is, a problem with how to collect digital artwork. Um, as far as, you know, in contrast to a physical piece, it isn't, it isn't sitting there in a physical place, so it's not like somebody um, comes across it. Or, I, I mean, I at least have a fear of videos that I make getting kind of lost in the cloud or in the history of because I don't, I don't feel like a need to save it in an archival way because it feels more flexible. Maybe I'll come back and change it later. And the, the eventual piece of art is an edited video from all these other scrap videos that I also have. That's, that to me too is why I want to work with digital art. You know, I think it's interesting in terms of attention because I think our attention is so often pulled by these digitized components in our lives. Um, but I also just really want to work with digital art forms because I'm so interested in the curation of, of time-based media. It's so bizarre. It's so hard. Physically, it needs like a different sort of maintenance than like a bronze. Thing. I mean, it's like a kinetic sculpture. So, I mean, is it archival only? You know, if the means are in place, that someone's going to keep it running forever. You know, the medium of my childhood is, is now, you know, archaic. 
and they have to go hunting around and buying up a certain VHS. They have the same problem with um, certain types of neon lights. So, you know, what happens maybe when if somebody wanted to re-show the work I made for, for the show, you know, what if uh, a Mac laptop isn't what it is today? Um, but I think that all mediums have that problem, and I think, uh, you know, to make work with the idea that it's going to look the same at any time in the, in, is, um, I don't know if naive is the word, but, but it's losing touch with the, where you are now. Uh, so, you know, if this is, this is a medium that's relevant now, um, and maybe there's a way to reference it. Cause like the piece that I have in there, I think really references old types of letter writing. You know, we don't really write letters like that anymore, but, um, but it's still a part of this, of the way I'm working with a new medium. It's still referencing an older one. So, uh, I mean, I think the, the idea of archival is certainly curious and how time plays out, but, um, you know, that window of time is getting shorter and shorter. So we're losing the possibility that, uh, that, that things will always look the same, but why would we want that anyway? Concepts, yes, will always be timely. The formats will have to be updated, I think. And then sometimes not, you know, it's like a personal decision of the curator and Hopefully, like if this work is ever represented, all of the artists will still be alive and can also be in on that conversation. Like, how do we rethink this piece? How do we represent this piece to hang on to the concepts, but make the presentation of it and the curation of it um, up to date, if that's interesting. <laughs> Digital art can be portrayed in so many different ways. You know, there's there's light um, that's controlled by it, by these digitized components in this very scale installation. There's um, projection, which can be very very poignant and soft, or it can be very very loud um, and busy and dizzying, which is what a pieces we have in this show. I mean, again, I, I guess what I'm saying is that it can be really playful. Um, the possibilities are endless, and I think. Curators can do, I mean, they can run the gamut. They can go super delicate and soft and sweet, or they can go really loud and obnoxious. <laughs> I think when considering digital artwork, you really have to pay attention to different things that um, go into a gallery. So you have to consider the cold, harsh screen, uh, that cooler lighting with the warm track lighting that you put as a spotlight on another piece. You also have to consider what things, what technical issues go into making a piece work. Uh, my piece at Dash right now needs Wi-Fi. If I didn't have internet for that piece, it wouldn't exist. When I made my senior show, I had to go in and turn on my pieces. It's just this very weird thing instead of flipping on a light switch you actually have to power everything up it only exists in this way um when it's turned on gallerists and art handlers need to be more conscious about the fluidity of media so i think that need to be um uh, by nature they just need to be more equipped to be handling this kind of artwork, so mounting screens or having projectors or borrowing projectors. Um, I think it means that instead of galleries and people specializing in one thing, people kind of need a wider breadth of skills. So um, perhaps somebody who normally would be, you know, hanging like hanging paintings on the wall, painting pedestals, moving things in and out would now also be a person who needs to rig up sound who needs to rig up projectors and and um also especially gallery lighting that is kind of a standard thing now needs to be a lot more considered because you don't want a light just kind of um coming down on a piece so i'm actually glad that the overall production of the gallery probably needs to be considered uh, even more thoroughly for digital artworks being included. 
I think this show is kind of an interesting, um, uh, an interesting example of what it can be. Um, for sure. I mean, obviously, you know, every, every artwork here is digital artwork. Um, and we have, we purposefully put Darcy's piece in the, just presented on an iPad on a wall that is 100 feet long. It's 100 feet long and 15 feet high. And it's all by itself. And we were like, isn't that weird? Aren't people going to be confused and kind of uncomfortable with this like very tiny iPad, not even centered, just kind of like, like, like aligned left on this like massive wall and we were like I mean it was beautiful because we didn't want the piece to be overtly distracting in terms of form we wanted it to be distracting in terms of content but what we did is we did make it incredibly distracting by making it so minimal um so you know I think the future of display is playful kind of I think curators get to make these decisions about being goofballs um and I think if it serves the concept of the show, you hang the iPad by itself because it's kind of funny and it's kind of sweet. I mean, I'm in love with it. I think it either comes to people getting more specialty skills and dealing with more kinds of technology or bringing in outside people who that's what they do. Um, there's a definite adaptation necessary at this time. I don't think that necessarily a white gallery is the end game for every work in general. I mean, I, I think a lot about site-specific work, and in some ways, making digital work to me is, is much more connected with that than any kind of conversation about gallery-centric work. The commodification of, of art is kind of removed when you're throwing it on the net. You know, it's it's this kind of interesting democratic free space. Um, so far, I mean, people could certainly um, monetize it if they wanted to. Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of think it's the web is going to exist very similarly to, to a physical gallery. You know, I think people will elect to, to look and go into certain places just as they elect to kind of go into certain galleries, you know. I think it's still going to be very much about the viewer and making decisions about what they want to see and engage with. The web could act as a gallery space for digital work, but only if they are to be presented in that way, if they were made to be for that platform. Otherwise, I think it's very important, even if using technology, to physically go into that space, to physically see that screen to step inside or maybe even in front of a projection, the way that you can obstruct that in a way that you can't on a screen. I think it's really important to be in a, in a physical space and as far as like the web being a placeholder, I don't think it can ever take the place of anything that should be displayed physically. Like I don't think of any of my work as being finished until it's been installed. Like when it's on the computer, like it doesn't, exist yet like i have like tons of things that will never be never be real it's, you know either uh, like sketches so i think right now it's like this idea of like online galleries and online exhibitions are trying to do the same thing they're trying to force this model that works in in brick and mortar space into a virtual space and i don't i don't think it fits so i think artists who are doing things that are taking advantage and accepting of what the internet is and what its what its limitations are are finding more success in that well i think that you know dealing with the the space of the internet as um as like a site specific space it would be how i would best kind of describe it a space with its own kind of uh, interesting problems to solve and interesting gifts i mean the thing that i there were several things that i was really excited about um, about doing the particular project i did for dash was like it can happen over time, you know, like I'm telling a story through email over months and you don't get that chance in many places or ways. Like I couldn't do a durational performance for two months in the gallery, you know, that's not a possibility, but I can write emails for, for two months and, and have a story take place in real time. Um, I also think that the reason I was excited to do this was that I think of um, the email having a potentially like 
um, mystical property that I could tap into that, that an email I send could be in my outbox and your inbox at the same time. I mean, that's a pretty amazing thing. It doubles. Um, or even if we think about the internet as a space, like where does that email really go? I, I don't, I don't know. Everything is flat now. Wouldn't it? And like, there's like, I still feel like not a really great way to consume art on the internet. And I know, yeah, there's a lot of people trying different things and trying different ways, but like, um, I don't know. I, don't, I feel like seeing art on the internet is still a step removed from like how it should be. Um, and maybe that's like an old fashioned way of looking at it, but I, I don't know. It doesn't, um, for me personally, it doesn't like stick with me. Like I, I don't know. Like I remember things for like thirty seconds or something I see online, but I could still remember, you know, great shows that I went to years ago. So the fact that the internet is not viewed as a valuable space because it can be theoretically infinitely duplicated. There's no rarity involved. There's no scarcity. Um, it also becomes a challenge of how do you create that new environment environment to to contemplate, you know, whatever the work is. I think that we have a different mentality for sure when we're looking at artwork on the web. There's just so much saturation. Um, and I think that you are um, more susceptible to just look at things that you wouldn't maybe so much care about elsewhere if they're just popping up in front of you on somebody else's Facebook page or something like that. Um, and because we're used to seeing things kind of fly by us on a screen, perhaps we're more receptive also. Um, I think maybe a comparison, if you were going to compare that to a gallery setting, would be a gallery kind of really overstuffed with artwork like have you seen that when it's just like there's too many things and nothing has enough space um maybe you can still like pick out something that you like and it has an impact on you but in general it really um undermines the power of each artwork there's so much it's a lot harder to develop an attachment when you're just like when you just see so much so I think um, the web could be more of an entry point or more of a something that holds the documentation of the artwork. Um, but again, it's really hard for anything to um, stand out a whole lot. I will say, I think that in some ways, uh, I'm starting to write a little bit about this. We are changing the main way we're making work with the idea of how does it exist on my website? I mean, I know that that comes into my mind sometimes when I'm trying to document it. The documentation of your work for the internet is is so crucial too. Um, and how do you make that, you know, translation from like what you're saying? Like, is it just an image? And like, how do you get that perfect image or something? I don't know. I drive myself crazy with that. Like, what's that like one picture that people are going to see and, and can it, tell the story of what that experience was. I usually can't, but, um, you know, it's another, like, skill that we have to have as digital artists, I think. A lot of times when people are installing a show, they will take a lot of Instagram photos of the pieces in progress, um, and they'll take a lot of photos about, like, one, they'll, they'll put up one piece on the Facebook page or they'll keep like posting something and the weird thing that happens is on one hand you feel like you're not absorbing that like how I said before it's hard to remember on the other hand when you get to the gallery maybe that piece has a lot of significance because you've already seen it and you feel like oh the artist thinks this is the number one piece because this is the photo head photo on the Facebook page and then then things don't get equal weight. If they've already been Instagrammed or if you've already seen photos of it, at least I find myself subconsciously looking for those pieces. It's like a recognition thing. And I think it could be helpful or hurtful. I'm not really sure. Like, 
I make it a policy to not put photos of my work on the internet before I show it. Just because I think I'm so affected by that when other people do it, but I know that's not the norm. So it might become something you just have to do for publicity so that people have that recognition. I don't know, um, again, like as we're talking about adaptation and attention spans, um, there's just all these extra things popping up where you think, am I going to play into that and like really pump up this piece and let people see it before they come see it? Or am I going to go against that and risk missing out on a PR opportunity just because I feel like I want people to formulate their own opinions, like with their eyeballs on the actual piece. And I, I am very preoccupied with the physical experience of a viewer. Um, so I think for me specifically, I wouldn't want to put, um, I wouldn't want to have a show online. You know, I wouldn't want to do that so much, but, but, but I can see where the appeal is. I, you know, it is interesting because instead of the viewer kind of having this physical response and having to be pulled through a curated space, they're, they're writing their own physical experience. You know, maybe they're sitting on the floor or maybe they're like on their phone on the subway. So they're like kind of creating their, their own physical space. And that's kind of an interesting idea. We go into vacant space that we find interesting uh, and then typically host exhibitions where artists respond to the space. Um, and so I think we're inviting the public into spaces that they're neglecting and not even neglecting, not actively neglecting, but just probably aren't even seeing. Um, we're bringing them through the door of spaces that they're typically not paying attention to. And when they walk in, it is my hope that the artwork therefore is kind of, um, the artwork is responding to whatever is happening in these dynamic spaces and kind of renegotiating them. Um, and to me, what we've done with, with exhibitions that are site specific exhibitions is we give people a sense of possibility. Um, you know, they're going into space, they're neglecting, but when they walk through the door, we're asking them to immediately be vulnerable and open to what's going on there. And they, I promise it works every time people suddenly their eyeballs kind of light up and they get a new sense of possibility of what's happening in that environment. Um, and that's the artwork, you know, it's, it, the curation has a lot to do with it, but it's, it's the artist and it's the artwork. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think it's, it's a pretty beautiful thing for people to kind of start looking at space differently than they typically would. And it's the, the artwork requires that I think, and it's, it's a, it's a ton of fun. I am really invested in site-specific spaces, and that's a way I've been working for a while now and something I think about a lot. Um, and and then on the kind of tail end of that comes that, that to me, the, the digital space is just another site-specific space, like a really, like I said, a really mystical one with a lot of expectations and um, a place that we, like I said, I, to me that is so you know, grounded in intense work and how we connect people. And then also like, you know, uh, intense vices and the, the way we kind of, you know, waste our time or, or do what we, we think we shouldn't be doing. Um, but, but I think that, that the digital space is, is just as much a raw space to be ignited. And, and I think it was exciting to see what people did. Ideally, I think maybe an artist's goal as far as redefining space is uh, making a work that's memorable enough in a space that turns over a lot, like a gallery. Uh, making a work that's memorable enough to where even maybe when you go back there, you know that it happened there. With sculptural installation, you really are utilizing the space and you're changing it by putting your work into a space versus the internet you know a projection is touching all of those walls you can step inside of it it does change the experience you can be that in that exact same spot but unless that projector is turned on and the piece is alive it's that same old room but once that piece is on everything changes you're you're now in an art piece and you think about that space in a different way, not only during, but after, you have these memories of what this space had in it.
What a what a beautiful thing to say too. And talking about like, um, you know, are we are we really present when we're like so preoccupied with this stuff? Um, but to think about artwork kind of creating memories in space, I, I think that's so lovely. You know, I think um, our environments do hold memories for us. You know, like our homes do, and our um, you know our schools, like all of these places. When you walk into your parents' home, right, you're like you're flooded with memories. And I think that that's really beautiful to think about artwork kind of prompting those things. Um, and I think about artwork enhancing space and space doing the same thing for kind of an artist practice. An artist getting to kind of push their practice um, by responding to something that they don't have much control over, you know, like something that's already there, something that someone else built um, and, and enhancing it. I think that's, I think that's a pretty cool thing by bringing art into that space and really giving it a different voice, it lives.